spring of 1918 offered both an opportunity and an imperative for the Imperial German Army. The March Treaty of Brest had put an end to Russian involvement in the Great War, allowing the Germans to redeploy some 50 divisions to the Western Front, giving them numerical superiority. But fear that U.S. entry into the war could shift the balance meant that the Germans felt that they had to defeat the Allies quickly before the U.S. could send significant reinforcements. Between March and July 1918, the Germans attacked along the Allied lines in what collectively became known as the Spring Offensive. The Spring Offensive was a massive and deadly campaign, and a seesaw battle in April 1918 around the French village of Vieux Bretonneau marked an important historic military first, the end of the first phase of the Spring Offensive, and the end of the war for a huge German demon named Mephisto. It is history that deserves to be remembered. The centerpiece of the Spring Offensive was Operation Michael. The offensive was to be launched in the area of Saint Quentin in northwestern France against the British Expeditionary Force. The Imperial High Command had determined that the British were near exhaustion after the bloody battles of 1917. It was thought that a strong offensive could separate the Allies, capture the Channel ports, supplying the BEF. The plan was to drive the British Army into the sea. The plan had merit. Following the Russian exit from the war, the Germans had a numerical advantage in the West. In fact, they had a great advantage. For Operation Michael, the Germans had amassed 74 divisions. Facing them, the British Expeditionary Force had just 27. And the assessment of the condition of those troops was not inaccurate. One British officer described the division as exhausted. The British were struggling to make good combat losses and had lowered the age of conscription. One Australian soldier wrote of companies of English children, pink-faced, round-cheeked, children flushed under the weight of their unaccustomed packs and the strap hanging loosely on their rounded baby chins. Intelligence had warned the British that an offensive was in the work, but those green recruits that were now filling the ranks of the British Expeditionary Force, those pink-faced English children, still had no idea what was coming. The offensive launched with a massive artillery barrage on March 21st. The British fought desperately, with many brave delaying actions. German losses were high, but the British were inexorably on retreat. Entire British battalions were being reduced. But by March 30th, both sides were nearing exhaustion, and the fate of Operation Michael depended upon the French village of Vie Bretonneau. The importance of the village of Vie Bretonneau had to do with the rail junction at Amiens. The German offensive was exhausted, its supply lines stretched. By taking the terrain around the village, the Germans sought a position of high ground from which the artillery could destroy Amiens, making it useless to the Allies. It was a last gasp, but one that could still make the BEF position on the continent untenable. The Germans were able to amass 15 divisions versus just 7 for the Entente. The success of the Spring Offensive and possibly the balance of the war depended upon who held the ground. A desperate battle between March 30th and April 5th brought the Germans within 500 yards of the village, but veteran brigades from the Australian Division had been brought up, and as the village seemed ready to fall, a surprise counterattack by the 36th Australian Battalion pushed the Germans back, and the British had managed to consolidate the position. But the Germans had one last attack in them. In late April, both the Germans and the Entente were consolidating their positions. The area around Vie Bretonneau was being held by the British 8th Division. What had been one of the best British divisions, it had been decimated in the Spring Offensive, where it lost some 250 officers and 4,700 men. The division was now filled with the companies of English children, those green and tested replacements, sent in with poor training. The British knew that it was dangerous to deploy them into combat, but they had little choice. And this time the Germans had brought along a demon to help them. The A7V was the only tank produced by the Germans to be used in combat during the First World War. It was a behemoth, a giant armored box, 24 feet long and 10 feet tall. A7Vs weighed more than 30 tons and mounted six machine guns. The main gun was a 57mm fortress gun, ironically produced by the British and captured by the Germans in Belgium. A typical crew was 18, although some carried as many as 25. The box was armored on the sides with three quarter inch thick steel, more than an inch thick on the front. Only 20 of the massive A7Vs were built, and to show the importance of Vie Bretonneau, Fifteen of those were sent to fight there. It became the fashion for the tank commanders of the A7Vs to name their tanks after characters from German folklore. Names included Nixa, meaning mermaid, and Woden, the German name for the Norse god Odin. One of the most terrifying names was Mephisto, another name for the demon Mephistopheles. Derived from the legend of Faust, Mephisto represented the devil himself. The name, chosen by tank commander Lieutenant Heinz Theensen, was painted on the side of the vehicle, vehicle number 506. 
In addition, the crew painted a depiction of the demon on the front of the tank, holding a smaller British tank under its arm. It was an interesting illusion. The new weapons of war had never faced each other in combat. 506 had participated briefly in the battle northeast of St. Quentin in March, a successful deployment where the German armor, both A7Vs and captured British tanks, had held back a counterattack. But the second battle of VA Bretonneux would be the first German attempt to mass their armor, and it was a brilliant attack. The A7V was powerful but ungainly. Its cross-country capability was poor with its thin tracks making it vulnerable to rolling over. But the ground near VA Bretonneux was relatively flat and undisturbed, and the German attack, launched at 4.45 a.m., began with an artillery bombardment that included gas. In the fog and the noise and the smoke, the British were unprepared for the German armored assault. Two of the A7Vs didn't even make it to the battle. The engine on one failed to start, and a second broke down. Early tanks were mechanically unreliable. But the 13 that came were enough to throw the British into disarray. One British officer reported the massive vehicles looming large and terrible out of the climbing wall of fog. How terrifying the German demon must have been rolling out of the smoke. The British were thrown back and the town taken. Much of the focus of the discussion of the battle was a moment outside the village of Kashi where three British Mark IV tanks of No. 1 Section, A Company, 1st Tank Battalion, encountered three A7Vs, including Nixa. It was the first tank-on-tank -tank action in history. Two of the three British tanks were armed only with machine guns and were forced to retreat. The remaining Mark IV engaged Nixa, but neither could score a hit. Finally, the commander of the Mark IV stopped his tank, allowing the gunners a better chance to hit. Nixa was hit three times and abandoned by its crew. The two other A7Vs withdrew. It was a seminal moment in warfare history, as was the arrival of faster British Whippet tanks armed only with machine guns who drove back German infantry. But in the end, the tanks had shifted the battle for the Germans, taking the contested town a VA Brett knew. And while the story of the first tank-on-tank -tank action in history is interesting, perhaps the story of the demon Mephisto tells us more about armored combat in the Great War. Mephisto had been part of a group of A7Vs that had attacked a farm and orchard outside the village. The British had been driven back by the assault. What is interesting though is that Mephisto survived to be closely examined, and it tells much about the fight and the role the armor played. While the common story is that the British infantry, many of them green replacements, disordered by the artillery and gas attack, fled before the might of the A7Vs, a close examiner of Mephisto, though, tells another story. Mephisto showed the scars of significant small arms fire. The hits were largely limited to the left side of the tank, suggesting the tank at some point came parallel to a British trench, perhaps by coincidence, but likely to facilitate raking the trench with machine gun fire. That position was confirmed in a British aerial reconnaissance photo. It's obvious from the damage that the British troops had considered methods for disabling a tank. While their presence there might have been a surprise, the British knew that the Germans were producing tanks, and the troops in the field were not completely without preparation. One example is a number of concentrated machine gun hits around one of Mephisto's exhaust ports. The short, controlled burst make it clear the gunners knew that this was a vulnerable area. Another is a British 303 caliber round near one of the machine gun ports. The machine guns on Mephisto were water-cooled MG8s protruding from ports in the side and rear. The shots were apparently aiming to hit the gun's water jacket to disable it. Perhaps most interesting is that there is a clear hit from a larger caliber weapon that made a good dent, but bounced off. It's never been determined exactly what weapon was used, or how it came to be in the trench. The damage shows the intensity of the battle, British troops trying to kill the demon with whatever they had. There are signs of close quarter attempts to disable the tank. The battle must have been horrifying to the crew as well. The armor of an A7V was not tempered, so each of the small arms hits would have chipped off bits of hot metal that would fly around the tank. The tank would have been filled with noise, and fumes, and oppressive heat. The damage to Mephisto demonstrates a desperate battle, an example of the terror of war in the Industrial Age. Maybe the most telling thing that we learned about armored combat from the Battle of VA Bretonneau was what happened to the great tank Mephisto. Despite all those attacks, the British were unable to damage or destroy the tank, and they were forced to withdraw. But after capturing the orchard, Mephisto broke down because it had a blockage in its fuel line. They managed to repair that and almost immediately drove into a shell hole and became stuck. The A7V had a notorious blind spot to the front as the driver had to look over the length of the long tank. Mephisto was behind German lines. It might have been recovered, but German engineers came and blew up Mephisto to keep it from being captured. It was done by mistake. They had apparently confused Mephisto with another German tank that had tipped over closer to the Allied lines. Of the 15 A7Vs that were taken to the Battle of VA Bretonneau, two broke down before the battle even began, one tipped over by itself, and 
Mephisto got stuck in a hole. The only one that was taken out by enemy fire was Nixa, and even it wasn't truly destroyed. The crew got back into Nixa and tried to drive it away, and probably would have been able to rescue the tank, except that the engine broke down. In the end, what we really learn about armored warfare in the First World War is that the tanks were more a danger to themselves than the enemy was. And although the A7Vs helped to win a great victory and capture the strategic village of VA Bretonneau, that very night, veteran infantry from the Australian 13th and 15th Brigades retook the village in a daring night attack. And that victory by the tanks was extremely short-lived. Maybe the biggest lesson of the Battle of VA Bretonneau was that the time of the tank had really not yet come. The next war would see to that. The village of VA Bretonneau retains a close relationship with the people of Australia who helped to fund the rebuilding of the village after the battle. Mephisto was behind German lines for three months before Australian troops retook the ground and captured the tank, taking it away as a war prize. Entente troops covered it in graffiti, including a picture of a British lion holding an A7V. The tank was taken to Australia, where it's been on display since. It was repairing damage caused by a flood in 2011 that the damage from the 1918 battle was clearly examined by explosive experts, giving the details of Mephisto's last battle. The daring Australian counterattack at VA Bretonneau marked the end of Operation Michael and in many ways the end of the Imperial German Army. Exhausted by the spring offensive that had gained a lot of territory but had failed to meet any of its objectives, the Imperial German Army would be defeated that fall in the combined Hundred Days Offensive. Like Mephisto, it seems that they simply couldn't dig out of the hole in front of them. Of the 20 A7Bs that were produced during the war, 18 were captured either during or after the war relatively intact, but all were scrapped except Mephisto, the last testament to the dawn of armored warfare. Today you can view Mephisto at the Anzac Gallery of the Queensland Museum in South Bank. Try out World of Tanks. It's a lot of fun. Remember, new players, go to the link in the description. Use the code FIREAWAY when you sign up, and I'll see you on the battlefield. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy it, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. And I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.